hello everyone. Welcome to Textile Talks. Um, it is just so much fun to see everyone um, chiming in and um, saying hello from locations all over the world. We have such a special program for you today. I'm here with collector Jack Walsh, whose quilts are now featured at the International Quilt Museum, or at least some of your quilts, Jack. Um, about a, a, a third of them. Yes, about a third. So, um, Typically, we would give an introduction right now to Jack, but um, Jack's going to do that for us today. Um, let me just give you a few facts. Jack is a New York collector, has been collecting studio art quilts since the 1990s. Um, he works with Penny McMorris, who's a dear friend and was a great friend of Artisan and Robert James when they were collecting studio quilts early on in the 90s. So. Um, I, what, what really struck me, Jack, when the first time I walked down as we were installing your show was just the incredible caliber of the artist in this group. It is a stellar group and just a gorgeous show. Um, so um, I've asked Lucy to post the link to our exhibition site on our website. And of course, we have that new Matterport program. So you can all go in and do a virtual walkthrough of the show. Jack and I are only talking about a few selected quilts today. So there's lots more to see. So I'd encourage you to take some time there. And I'll remind you of that, that link as well later. So Jack, welcome. Um, we are just so pleased to have you and what a thrill for us to have your collection or, or your show here at the museum. Well, thank you, Carolyn. And thank all of you, I thank all of you for being here today because there's nothing I enjoy more than talking about art quilts. That's right, uh, we're gonna have so much I'm fun. Bit with my background because the show at the International Quilt Museum is about the water theme quilts and water has been a very important part of my life. Uh, my first recollections of water start out with two experiences, one great, very, very good, and one very bad when I was a young child and I was a preschooler. Uh, and uh, if you would like, can you put up the frost? Let's play? go. Yeah, I'll go okay. ahead and share my screen and then um, we'll see if everybody is able to see that. How is that looking? Can you see the slide presentation, Jack? Yes, the, the first the first one is up, and okay, I think we great. Need the second one for for uh, Jack's falling water. All right. So just to note, yep. everybody, that Jack's show opened just this weekend and will be up until April fourth of twenty twenty three. So maybe you have a chance to come visit. So let's go to our first slide, Jack. Oh, and Jack, before we get started. We just to let everyone know, while Jack is talking about these quilts, we have an overall, but I also went down and took some um, photos myself to add some details. So while Jack's sharing his story, I'm just gonna advance one more slide so that everybody can see the details. And then Jack will let me know when we're ready to go to the next quilt. So go ahead, Jack. Okay, so when I was uh, very young, my grandfather had a farm in upstate New York and on it was this beautiful glen uh, with waterfalls. And when I was a little guy, uh, just big enough to, and old enough to walk, uh, and I'd visit my grandparents in the summer, this was the glen that I used to play in. Now, I didn't get to go up to the swimming hole when I was younger, uh, which is this uh, slide shows, uh, but I played in some of the lower flat spots. And uh, uh, I, from an early age, I came to love uh, playing in water. Later on, or probably about the same time, actually when I was about three or four, uh, we lived near Pittsburgh uh, in a house that was on the edge of Frick Park. And there was a stream uh, flowing behind our house and the water in the Pittsburgh area in the late 1930s and early 1940s was highly polluted. Uh, but there was this little brook with stepping stones across it and we used to go my twin brother and I across it with our mother periodically. But one day we went across the brook and on the way home, mom stepped off the stone and her dipped her foot into the stream. Now she didn't fall down. She didn't uh, uh, have, it, have that sort of an accident, but her foot and her leg did get in the water. And when we got home, my parents were very surprised to see that the nylon stocking had dissolved off my mother's leg. Oh my. That, I don't know, I've been thinking lately, maybe that's a, one reason why uh, I made 
uh, improving the quality of water and making water safe for people to use my career. Another yeah, experience we had uh, when I was uh, in my beginning teenage years, uh, my dad got transferred out to Gary, Indiana, and my parents bought a house on the edge of Lake Michigan, right on the beach. And so I spent several years there where the water was pure and the air was pure. And uh, when we had a big storm on Lake Michigan, the spray from the waves would hit our house. Wow. So those were my growing up experiences. When I graduated from college, I went to work for a small company in New York City that specialized in uh, water chemistry for ocean ships. And everywhere where a ship of water came in, in contact, contact, whether it was the uh, steam power plants or the hulls which were corroded or the pollution issues relative to the ballast that was discharged, uh, ships had lots of water and water problems. And that was a wonderful area to do innovative work in dealing with water problems. My first big responsibility was for the water chemistry program on the nuclear ship Savannah, the world's first uh, non-military nuclear ship. Wow. And it was used to open up ports uh, around the world to nuclear power because there were many countries that did not have nuclear power back in the, uh, the early and mid 60s. And we'd go around from port to port and it was a big thing. I only took one cruise on it. Uh, that was in 1964 where we went to open up the ports of Rotterdam, Antwerp in Belgium and Le Havre in France. Uh, but to give you an idea of what, how high publicity this stuff was, one morning when we were tied up at the dock in uh, Antwerp, uh, I came down to my little laboratory, which was about the size of a walk-in closet. And when I got there, and that was down in the engine room, when I got down into the engine room, the guys in the engine room were all saying, you missed them, you missed them. And I said, who? And they said, the king and queen of Belgium were here in your little laboratory a few minutes ago. So wow. that was my first major responsibility. But I got involved in many other things having to do with water chemistry, managed the first, uh, the development of the first widely used monitor for oil pollution in water. I uh, did the design of the ultraviolet water purifiers that the US Public Health Service used when they uh, accepted UV for uh, as an alternate to chlorination and actually got a patent for a device to measure the intensity of the UV in the purifier. Did work in desalination. And eventually uh, as the US merchant marine industry started to collapse and we had to move into other water chemistry areas, uh, I started two other companies. Uh, one was an instrument company that manufactured uh, uh, water quality analyzers for ultra pure applications, mostly in the uh, electric power industry. But we had a sodium analyzer for steam purity that if you took a grain of salt out of a salt shaker and put it full in a swimming pool full of water, uh, it would tell you you had put one grain in. And if you took that grain of salt and cut it in 10 pieces, it would tell you how many pieces you had dissolved. That's we also, uh, my son John and I developed a, uh, I founded a company to use food grade phosphates to prevent lead pipe from corroding and therefore reduce the lead in drinking water. And by using the phosphates that we used to, for things like curing ham, uh, we were able to formulate special long chain compounds and we could add one part of our phosphate compounds to a million parts of water one gallon of ours to a million gallons of water, and it would reduce the uh, amount of lead in the drinking water by 75%. Uh, we ended up treating the drinking water of about 20 million people across America. That is amazing, Jack. That must feel so great. And that's something that, boy, water is such an issue these days. That's so important now. Well, now I can see why you, uh, why you uh, wanted water quilts. It's just been such a big part of your life. It has, and, and that's gotten, you mentioned uh, the, the uh, water uh, uh, being a big part of people's lives, but this is one of the things, when I started out, nobody had a water problem. If you wanted to sell somebody something to make their water better, you had to first convince them they had a problem with it. And the other thing was, in those days, it was all cause and effect. You have uh, uh, bacteria for uh, 
a typhoid in your uh, drinking water, you get typhoid. Nowadays, it's all statistical. You have a certain kind of uh, organic chemical in your water in the concentration of 10 parts per million, then you have a one in uh, a 300 chance of getting a certain kind of cancer. It's not, it's, it's all changed. Well, and you've been a big part of that. To, uh, the collection, because this is, this is a really fun part of the story. I was in England in 1988 and I, was back in my room in the hotel, turned on BBC, and there was Michael James uh, teaching people how to make quilts and showing his art quilts. And I was just, you know, I was just knocked over by what I saw. And I came back and I wanted somehow to be involved. And so I dabbled. I bought two Mennonite quilts, an Amish quilt, a crazy quilt, a Native American quilt. I got out my grandmother's quilts. I covered just about every surface in the house that could hold a quilt with a quilt. I had no idea what I was doing, but I was subscribing to quilt magazines. And in one of them, I saw that there was uh, going to be an event, Louisville celebrates the American quilt, where they were going to have six quilt shows and they were going to have a whole weekend of lunches and dinners and, and symposium and so forth on quilts. And I thought, okay, I'm gonna spend a weekend and see if I can figure out what's going on between me and quilts. So I went there and the first 24 hours, I saw all six quilt shows, African-American quilts, Amish quilts, uh, uh, historical quilts and, and various other shows. I saw all the shows, I liked all the quilts, but I loved the art quilts and I knew that's where I wanted to be involved. And the last lecture at the last symposium I went to, uh, the speaker got up and talked about collect collecting art quilts and said simply, it's very sad about art quilts because there's lots of great art quilts being created and not that many people are interested. And so I sat there and mentally raised my hand. And then she said another thing which was so important and that was that Bob and Artist James who had the world's greatest collection of quilts were in the audience. So right after the talk, I went over and I introduced myself to Bob and Artist and I said very simply, I want to collect art quilts. I don't know the first thing about it. What would you do if you were in my shoes? And they were so generous and they said, well, we'd like to introduce you to the person who advises us when we buy art quilts and took me over and introduced me to Penny McMorris. And right on the spot, we decided to create a collection of art quilts. And Penny had some good ideas, which she suggested. Uh, she said that we want to collect the best of the best and if we see somebody who has done great work, but we think they are not up to that right now, we'll wait. And then we agreed with, you know, what her compensation would be, all of that. And we agreed that we would wait, we would collect for a year, and then we would buy 10 quilts in that year and see how we felt when we were done. The end of the year, we bought 15, so the answer was obvious. It was obvious. Two months after I met Penny, she invited me to her house. She had put together a retrospective on 15 artists by taking 800 slides out of her collection of slides of art quilts. And for eight hours, I sat at the light table at her kitchen with a jeweler's loop in my eye. And we went through those quilts, all those quilts, and I would put this jeweler's loop up to my eye as long as I could stand it. Then I'd put it down <laughs> and put it up to the other eye. But at the, end of the, at the end of the day, I had an idea of what art quilts were all about and also uh, the course of the uh, careers of 15 of the major artists. The wow. Penny was a wonderful mentor and a trainer and uh, remains a, a great friend. And I cannot thank her enough for all that she's done to help me get my start and, and go on with what I've, what I've done. She has been so influential on your collection, on the James collection, and, and what an amazing eye she has. That's just incredible. It is. Well, and should we go, should we talk about the, the other images that we've got? Are you ready to move on to a new slide, Jack? And uh, well, I just while about, you're talking, I, I can show another quilt if that's okay. Yeah, go ahead. I just want to say this as far as Penny is concerned and her influence. She and Michael Kyle did the first book on art quilts. They did the first show on art quilts and she was the one that coined the term art quilt. So as you say, Carolyn, her influence has been phenomenal. Absolutely. And um, so we had uh, 
Gail, um, Gail, Slade, Gail Frost and Duncan Slade, and this is Falling Water. And the next thing we have is Susan Shy. I love this piece so much. Yes, now this was, both of those are commissions. Uh, this, I was with Susie at a uh, uh, Quilt National and the artists and other hangers on like myself get a, together in the evening and talk. And we, we were talking and we talked about the fact when I was working in water chemistry that her uncle was working with a company that I had done some work with. And so then later on when I uh, uh, decided to offer her a commission on water on water she said well i want to do it on your career in water and i said no no susie that's 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 not about self-aggrandizement it's about uh, creating a work of art but i talked to penny and penny said susie's the artist let her do what she wants and so <laughs> this is what she did and it was wonderful and yeah. that typically when you um asked artists even when you commissioned work you really didn't give them a lot of direction you kind of let them do their own style and their own thing within this um kind of genre well this is this i wanted to say because the ideas of commissions came somewhat shortly after i started collecting and i realized the amount of time that went into making one of these works of art and i got thinking about the fact that the artists don't get much money in men, most cases if you look at it for all the time they put in. And I got thinking about the fact that, you know, they, this must impede their creativity sometimes when they think, uh, you know, after I put all of this effort into this work, am I gonna be able to sell it? And so the idea of the commission initially was to find somebody whose work had plateaued and we felt would benefit by following a vision or a, an idea without being inhibited in any way. And I added water as a subject because water is ubiquitous. You can approach it from so many different ways. And at the same time, it would provide a little constant thread, excuse the pun, <laughs> through, through the uh, commissions. And uh, it, water has been so important to me. Well, and I, one of the things I was also struck at when I um, walked the show, Jack, was just the amazing different techniques that we're seeing. So we had some amazing printing in this Frost and Slay quilt. And with Susie's quilts, it's all about her writing and her text. And I think you see that really wonderfully. And I, and I picked out both details that had your name on them, Jack, so we right. could see those. Um, but I think that it's so fascinating that her pieces really are about the text and the, the way that it creates that texture in the quilt and the visual appeal of it and all done with this um, airbrush uh, application. It, it's true. And, and she does include many different images that are personally important. When uh, she was starting the quilt, she said she needed a woman and a girl to put into the quilt. And it, when you look before, you could see them uh, one, one water into the picture of the other. And so could I recommend one? And yes, I, uh, so I said, I would recommend my daughter, Kathy, and my granddaughter, Zoe, who was in grade oh, school. And when Zoe so found special. out she was going to be in the quilt, she said to her mother, mommy, we're going to be famous. <laughs> that even and, makes it more special, Jack. Wow, that is so yeah. lovely. Yep, so that's that. We could go on to the next one now. All right. Oh my gosh, I, I am in love with this piece, Jack. I really am. I, yeah, I thought, did, did we miss one? Did, did we, uh, oh, wait a minute, let me see where we are. No, did we, did we miss Nottingham Reflections from Pauline? It's coming up yet, Jack. It's coming, it's coming up, up. Okay. We, we must yeah, have this, be a little, uh, my slides are a little out of order for you. This one is, uh, is Tim Harding, I, and I should say too, but later on, we got into doing the commissions and I, Penny helping me to, to determine who, who, would, who would benefit. Uh, we did not necessarily need to be somebody who had plateaued, simply somebody who we felt could benefit from being able to follow a, an, an idea or a, 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 a thought and, and not, not be inhibited in any way. So this is a big one. This is Tim Harding. And I don't know if you all know Tim's technique, but he takes a, a number of layers of uh, monochromatic silk and he stacks them and then he stitches the, the patterns in and then he cuts through the layers 
And sometimes he lets the fabric hang, sometimes he cuts it away, uh, but that's his technique for creating the, uh, uh, creating the wonderful works that he does. It's, a, it's an amazing technique. And I like the way he did the raw edges and the way that the fabric moves. I love this piece of the way he created the movement of the waves is just so beautiful. And then the, the abstracted figures within the water, it, it just, it, it just one of those pieces that you can look at and look at and you see different things every time. It's true. And it, when, you, when you're standing looking at it, uh, the water actually seems to move. It's, it does. it's a, an amazing illusion. It is. It's, it's something that fascinates me when artists can create that sense of movement and that realism in their, in their textile works, in their one-dimensional work. It's really stunning. Mm -hmm. Let's go on to, here's Nottingham, Nottingham Reflections. Reflections. Now, Nottingham Reflections was the first commission that we did. And uh, I was lucky in that I got to, uh, I had a, a business trip over to the UK and I got to visit Pauline and her husband, Charlie Paulson, while, while Pauline was making this. Uh, and this had the exact effect that we were hoping for because when Pauline got done, she said, this has not only changed my work, it has changed the way I do my work. I now have enough new ideas to last me for the next 10 years. <laughs> And that was exactly what we were hoping. It's all about freeing up energy, creative energy. And I think that Pauline, I mean, her workmanship is so interesting because she uses such an interesting combination. She doesn't settle on like just piecing or stitching or overstitching. In fact, I believe she termed it um, drawing with thread in some of her techniques as well. So she so. really does amazing combinations. And I love that in her pieces. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the detail, you can see she's got both machine quilting and hand stitching, both on this particular piece. Right, it's true. Oh, yeah. So people ask, what, what do I look for in a quilt? What matters to me on art quilt? Or why am I so taken by art quilts? And there are several factors. The first one is the flow of energy. There seems to be a flow of energy from the uh, artist through the quilt, art quilt to the viewer. Uh, we could go to the next uh, All right. Next one. And when I say flow of energy, it can be a, a quiet flow, like what one experiences sitting by a brook in, in, in the woods or by reading uh, Robert Frost's poem, The Road Not Taken. This one, uh, when I commissioned Rachel Broomer to, to create it, uh, she waited for a couple of months before she, well, she, there was a time period after she accepted the commission before I heard from her. And then she came back and she said, I've spent the last couple of months reading all I could about the place that water plays in the world's great religions. And then she created the, this one with the washing of the feet and the raindrops. And one of the things I have observed in a number of cases is this has a very calming effect on people. The first time I saw that, I was living in New Jersey at the time, and I had a man who uh, cut the lawn for me, and he was a combative type of person. He, uh, he was a professional kickboxer to start with, and he always seemed to be in some kind of conflict with people. But we got to know each other through various conversations, and I found out that he got interested in looking at my art quilts. And so whenever I had a new art quilt, I'd invite him in to see it. And I invited him in to see this. And when I did, he just stood there and stared at it. And after a while, he turned and he said, this makes me feel so peaceful. Wow. And I thought if it worked on him, it would work on a lot of people. <laughs> I love that you made another uh, devotee out of your yard man, Jack. That's great. You well, that's know, sometimes that's all it takes is just letting people know that art quilts are out there. They really do appeal. And so it's just great to get to expose people to them. Well, I agree with you. And this is one of the things that impresses me is the accessibility. So many times I see somebody fascinated with an art quilt who is a person that I would never in a million years expect to see in an art museum. We had, when I was working in my office, offices, I had art quilts, 
and I had one hanging outside my office in the, in the main administrative area where people came in uh, to make deliveries and so forth. And we had a UPS man, and the only thing I ever heard him talk about was his sports betting pools that he was running <laughs> as he went on his route. Well, one day I looked out, and and I was and he was standing there just staring at this art quilt. So I got up out of my office and I went out and I said to him, you know, would you like to discuss this? Would you like me to share a little bit about uh, what's going on here? Uh, and I think this may have been, uh, this art quilt might have been uh, the, uh, well, it's not gonna come in sequence, might have been Katie Pasquini Masopus uh, quilt, Rio Hondo. At any yeah. rate, uh, he's, I came out and we talked about it and he was just was just so interested in, in it and finally when I got done he turned to me and he said this is more than just art oh, <laughs> and I thought, well, here's a person who has no idea what art can be but but he gets it here the third yeah. thing I think is so important to me about art quilts and I like is what I call layers of fabric layers of meaning Oh, let's let's move on to a couple more of these here. Okay. Uh, okay this, this is the other side of the flow of energy. It, it can have a calming effect, or it can be exciting. And this one uh, by Terry Mangot, uh, which was a water was a, a different group of commissions, uh, but it's uh, on the climate change and the Kelvin glaciers and wildfire. And it's big. It's ten feet tall. It's just so and it has such an impact when one views it. So and let's, we have let's a, like, I love Terry's work. So I did go a little overboard with some of my details here, but um, I just wanted to point out we also have a second quilt. So you have a pair of quilts by Terry in the show that are both just enormous. Yes. And then that this one is a great illustration for uh, a third. Uh, uh, thing that is, I think is so important about art quilts. It's, and that is what I call layer, layers of fabric, layers of meaning. It takes so long to create an art quilt that frequently the artist will have other ideas uh, and, and add to. And so eventually the, just simply the thoughts that are embedded can be quite complex. Now in this particular case, when uh, Terry was commissioned to make an art quilt on water, uh, she started thinking about the cycle of water in nature, the flow of water up to the clouds and then back to the ground again. And then she started thinking about uh, the fact that uh, water is the largest element in our bodies. And then she was thinking about the place that relig in religion that water has. And so, and these, all of these thoughts came together to give her the idea that perhaps it is water that ties us together with all these creatures in the world and, and gives, gives us a, a common bond. Wow. And, and that's an example of all of these different ideas in the same work. Well, and Terry is known for her embellishment. So I just had a couple more images because what always strikes me are just like you said, the layers, the layers in her quilt. So she's doing applique, she's doing machine um, piecing, um, she's doing a lot of handwork. And then she just adds all of these embellishments to the surface. Um, I asked her when she was here, how does she know when she's done? She's like, I just know, I just know. Because she just, she adds so much to the pieces and the, the surface is so fascinating. There is another aspect that I'd like to share too. If you could go back to the uh, to the full image, one of the things about Terry's work is that she incorporates personal items uh, in the in in the art quilts. And if you look at the uh, cloud that is up in the upper left hand corner, that was made out of her mother's wedding dress. Oh my and gosh. It makes, makes it so personal. She, she's amazing. Um, we are just so fortunate um, to have Terry um, still creating work. And that's another thing about so many of these artists, they've had long careers. And so they've just really, um, their work is developed and, and um, it's fascinating to see that progression. Yes. Well, we have a couple more that we could see. Maybe we can go on to uh, 
the next one, this is John Lovell Holtz's Monet Over Money. And this is another one, which uh, another art quilt, which illustrates the, the layers of meaning. John is, has been, uh, was formally educated in painting, printmaking, and jewelry making. And he brings all of this to bear in this one art quilt. He has the quilt, the front is pretty much kind of a, a light beige gray. The back is black cloth. So on the, he has taken and printed currency, uh, dollar bill size pieces of currency, but the currency has Monet's bearded face on it instead of George Washington. <laughs> now on that, he has, uh, we'll talk, we can talk about this and then we'll go back a bit. Uh, on his, this art quilt, he has pinned various dragonflies, which he has created, and the wings of each have something to say about art or money. And in this case, this is a quotation from Napoleon, and the French translates, a sketch is worth a long discourse. <laughs> Now, if we could go back for a second on this one too. Sure. The, the next, the, the other thing that he did was he took mesh and on it, he printed a replica or no, I'm painted a replica of one of Monet's lily pond paintings. And then, I don't know, did you get it? Did you get a shot of the back, Carolyn? I don't have a shot of the I back. Have, I didn't get one either, but the back, has black cloth and then on it is again currency sized uh, pieces of paper, but it's red paper and on it is printed blue uh, fish. And when I got the art quilt, some of the pieces of red paper on the back had black smudges on it. And I was worried that perhaps the color and the dye from the black fabric was leaching through the paper. So I called up John and I said, hey, I'm seeing black smudges on the back of the art quilt. Uh, is this uh, something I should get a, con a conservatory to look at? And he laughed and he said, no. He said, what I was trying to do there was emulate the Shroud of Turin using Monet's oh. facial features. <laughs> <laughs> the detail the in this work. Activity is fantastic. And you know, when you look at this piece, as you walk up to it, it just, you don't see the currency first. You see just this beautiful, you know, Monet-like piece that looks like water lilies. And then as you get closer to it and you really begin to look, there are just so many layers in it. I love that. That's true. So yeah. perhaps we can go on for to the, All right. to the next, uh, next one. This is Rio Hondo. We've already talked about Rio Hondo, but there's, there's another story to Rio Hondo too. And that is, the, this got uh, this art quote got lost coming back from a ma from a major uh, venue where it was exhibited, and yeah. it got lost under suspicious circumstances. And by that I mean uh, I received an empty box back, <gasps> and when I got the uh, the exhibitor's uh, shipping records, it showed that I had been shipped an empty box because the quilt weighed seven pounds, the box weighed four pounds and the box that they shipped weighed four pounds. And so then I started asking them, trying to get them to help me find it. And it just became more and more suspicious. So I finally got the FBI looking for it. And wow. what happened, because I thought maybe if I scared somebody, it would shake it loose <laughs> and it would, it would reappear somewhere. And I said, I got the FBI looking for it. I'd been to a family wedding and met a, a distant relative who had worked for the FBI. And when this happened, I called him up and he said, well, the FBI has just decided to take on art theft as, as something and we need training exercises. So maybe they'll take it on, take your quilt on as a training, as a training opportunity, which is what happened. And the FBI went into the exhibitor and, and uh, showed the FBI back badges and said, we're looking for Jack's quilt. <laughs> what happened was six months later, it reappeared 400 miles away in a truckload of salvage. Fortunately, Katie had st stitched her name on the back in Santa Fe. They called her up and uh, uh, I got the art quilt back. Wow. Yeah. 
Well, and this quote was one of the 20, the top 100 of the century. This is such an important piece. That would have just been so tragic had you not found it. Well, it would have been, but, and you know, uh, I could go on about this story, but the, uh, uh, the exhibitor, Katie was so concerned that I would get it back intact that when the show was over, she happened to be where the exhibitor was located and she packed it herself and took it down to the shipping department. And so then those people, this, started saying, well, maybe she took it. But I knew oh. Katie and, uh, I, you know, and I also knew how devastated she was that it was lost. Yes. Because, it, yeah, it is one of her, one of her really milestone works. Yes, it is. And, you know, um, in these two details, I, have the, I there's a couple things I love so much about this quote. I love the way she's created these bars of color that go through the kind of the ground. So it's a very, na you know, very natural, very nature-esque quilt, but she's really added all these abstract elements. And I, uh, one of the first times I saw machine quilting on a quilt, on an art quilt, um, was another piece by Katie that we received. And it really sold me on just how the, the machine quilting was just so perfect in this type of quilt. And so it really made me realize all of the possibilities of machine quilting. So great, yeah. And this, just all of the variations of the quilting adds so much to it. Mm -hmm. Yes. So let's go on to a couple others because uh, with most of these ones that we've looked at and, and including this one, uh, these are all art, these are all water quilts, but they, sometimes they have come in uh, through different ways other than through a water commission. Now, back in 2017, I became uh, aware that there seemed to be a, a, a almost a malaise in, in some of the world of, of art. People who creative people didn't seem to be quite as energized and so forth. And I was thinking about it and I was aware that there was a lot of anger out in the world at that point in time. And thinking that maybe uh, knowing that anger which is not expressed can lead to depression. I just wondered if there was a lot of bottled up energy. So I offered commissions to 15 artists and 11 accepted. Uh, three had retired and one was working in a different direction. And I asked them all to make it on the subject uh, of Bob Dylan's song, The Times They Are a Changing, and anything they want to do about uh, t changing times. Now, this one, Kairos and Kronos by Shin He Chin, uh, Shin He had been uh, on a government sponsored project uh, working in China with 10 artists, with, along with 10 American artists. And so she decided to do it on two different ancient books and their uh, the way they look at time. One was Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament, which uh, looks at time as the right time for something. And the other one was I Ching, the ancient Chinese book of changes, which talks about the flow of time. And this art quilt is made, uh, the image uh, is made using a very unique technique uh, where she takes and stitches down individual threads uh, as, as you can see. Uh, and it's, all, it's basically the moon and the tides, and that's what that's showing. Wow. So she's, let, and in the detail, you can really see she's just kind of massing threads together and then stitching them in place. So it's not really a machine stitching like we often see the thread work we see. This is a really unique technique. It is. It's very, and it's something she's developed herself. And sometimes quilts come in that are not commissioned. And so we have another water quilt uh, com coming up. Are, are you ready? There you go. This is Water Sample by Teresa Barkley. Uh, Teresa is a uh, fashion designer and she has thousands of samples of different fabrics. And she heard me give a talk at the Manhattan Quilters Guild. And I talked about water quilts. And she went back to her stash, uh, if you could call it that, it's so huge, uh, of fabrics and pulled out a hundred different water fabrics that were the color blue. And she created this water sample uh, on her own with the various uh, pieces of fabric arranged like test tubes. 
there's a couple details. She really did have an amazing collection of fabrics and really interesting fabrics that look like they're from all over the world. And some of them ancient too. Wow. Because one there from when the, the water aqueduct came, uh, was celebrating the fact that the aqueduct uh, bringing water came into New York City. It's a beautiful, beautiful piece. And, and I love that in part of the exhibition, you kind of come around a corner and then you enter this space where there's just a lot of these beautiful blue quilts and it is just such a peaceful feel. You know, like you said, you see Terry Maggot at the distance and there's nothing peaceful about those works, but I love that you get kind of a different emotional reaction to your show as you go through. Yes. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. so well, Jack, um, I don't know, I think that might've been our last water quilt, but we have some really great pieces that we just had to include from your collection. So okay. I think if I remember correctly, ah, I love oh, yeah. this so much. So tell us all about this, Jack. Yeah, well, this is the pancake and syrup quilt with bacon rug. Uh, it was in the 1976 show, The New American Quilt. And Ross Cross came to the US from England and she was astounded with the amount of food that Americans heaped on their plates. And so this, this is the only art quilt in the collection that is supposed to be displayed on a bed. And it, uh, that is what that is. Now, I saw the, that show back in 1976, uh, you know, 12 years before I saw Michael James on TV. But I always remembered this quilt. And eventually, I got together with Penny and said, hey, you know, it would be wonderful to have this quilt in the collection. And we went looking for it, and we couldn't find it. We didn't find it anywhere. But one day I got a call from Bob Shaw and he said, I have just uh, received a, an older art quilt. I think you might be interested in. And this was it. it uh, I was able to add it to the collection after all. And this has separate pieces to it. So it has the form that goes over the bed and then the, the bacon lays on the side. Is that right? Yeah, and it has butter there up in the upper left hand corner, up in the upper, upper corner, there's a pad of butter. I didn't notice that. Oh my yeah. gosh. Well, Ross Cross was a really interesting quilt maker and she made things that I feel like no one else was doing at the time. And a lot of them were very sculptural. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great piece. All right, well, we've got a few more and we're doing well on time. So oh, Arturo Sandoval, here's another oh. artist that is just, his vision is incredible. Yeah, except for how somehow the, the, the label labeling on this quilt is not right. I don't know it's how. It's not. I, if I messed up, but putting it in. This is Kang I chose uh, aged covered with wisdom. Oh my this gosh. Is, you know, that, was, that was my mistake, Jack. I think I, I was looking at images and I must've put the wrong one here, but so is this wood? This is wood. Kyung Ai works in wood. She's not a quilter for the most part, but she will venture into quilting every once in a while if it, get, it allows her to do what she wants to do. In this particular case, she took 441 four inch squares of pine and she put holes in the corners and laced them into this black uh, cloth quilt. And she has created patterns, not only with the way the blocks are, are arranged, but with the, uh, the darkness or lightness of the blocks. And when you, if you can see this quilt uh, up close, which you can't this, in this show, uh, when you see this quilt up close, she has even arranged the cracks in the pieces of wood to create patterns. That is astounding. Now, how heavy is that quilt? Is that I mean, it must be just incredibly heavy. It's, it's fairly heavy, but it's probably, oh, I don't know. I guess it wouldn't be more than 25 pounds, something like that. But I have one that weighs 75 pounds. And that was made by Ann Kingsbury. And she uh, is a wonderful ceramicist, as well as a quilt maker. And she created a circus quilt, which is 12 feet by seven feet, made entirely out of leather and ceramics, the leather being suede. We don't have a picture of it here, but the that has three rings, and around the outside, uh, you have 
uh, the audience, which is made from 376 individually handmade ceramic plaques. Wow. It took her three years to make it. I love that you really have embraced these artists who are working in different mediums, Jack. I mean, what a rich way to enhance your collection. Um, and um, unfortunately, um, these slides were ones that you shared with me. I couldn't take details of these, but um, so I'm sorry we don't have that. I don't have a measurement on this. We had a question about that, but the 400 blocks of wood are six inch by six inch. So that gives you an idea. That's a pretty good size piece. I actually think they're four inch by four inch. Uh, four inch. Oh. Yeah, but that's still because you've got what, five, 10, 18 pieces across, that's six feet right there. Yes, yeah, so that'd be about right, about eight by eight. And you know, that I, I was really struck by so many of the pieces that you have collected that you really don't shy away from the large pieces. And I love well, that, that because so many of these artists have made such large works for your collection. Well, we, I have a kind of, when I've commissioned, I've said, you know, said only two things, make it, um, make it out of water and make it large. But you were talking about the, the different materials and so forth. And this was uh, part of the uh, uh, original mission of the, of the collection was to uh, document the full range of what was happening in the medium. And so you'll see uh, uh, one, one art quilt that is very much like a traditional quilt just with a couple of innovations. Or you'll see another one, which is you shake your head and say, how could that be a quilt? And um, just for everybody, um, Lucy added um, in the chat, she did give us the name of this artist so that you can see it and the, the spelling we will be correct on that. So I apologize for the error on that slide. So go to the chat and you will see Lucy's information. So here's another really interesting piece. And we've got a couple images of this. Yes, uh, this is another John Level hoax piece. He did the Monet over money. Now I mentioned with regard to the uh, Shin He Chin uh, work that I had asked uh, a variety, a number of artists to make an art quilt uh, on the changing times and kind of used as a, as a mantra, the uh, uh, Bob Dylan song. I got a call from John Level hoax after he got his commission, he said, you know, would it be all right if I use computer driven LEDs in my art quilt? And I said, sure, go for it. And so later on, he sent me a video and he uh, said, well, I went beyond that and I included motion detectors and range finders. And so now he has this large map of the United States. And if you're, you, this is now seen as if you were viewing it from the left hand side because thinking about the two political parties and the, associate, uh, the colors associated with them, if you view this from the left-hand side, it turns blue. If you wander around to the right-hand, the Republican side, it turns red. And <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. Just that it thoughtfulness is. that he used in creating this yeah. is incredible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he's one of the creative, well, there's so many creative ones out there. They're all creative in their own way, but, he, he does the move in new directions. And in this detail, you see that what looks like little towns on his map are actually more, what, words that he just well, he, related? It, what, what were the words very, about? This is, this, is very, this is very good. This is good, uh, a good thing to point out because there's roads across and then where the roads cross, there are these little towns. Now the roads are the characteristics of people who engage actively in social movements. And the cities are where those roads cross. And those are the uh, emotions that are generated when people from different social movements encounter each other. Wow. You know, I, I am just always, it's one of the things I love about my job are, are getting to know artists and, um, understanding their work and on all of the every detail means something so important and, and Jack I just think it's so amazing and so lovely that you get so involved with these artists and you work with them one-on-one -on -one. so you have that opportunity to really understand what they're doing I think that is just so terrific well I can tell you that I it's a wonderful thing for me because uh, I gain so much for them but insights but also 
energy, creativity, and simply great friendships too. Isn't that great? That's the best thing is, and, and there's something wonderful about being around such incredibly creative people. I find it very inspiring always. It, so I think we've got- Sometimes they'll, sometimes, sometimes they'll make you stand there and just, just in amazement. I tell one story had not having to do with quilts. I visited Arturo Sandoval in his home in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, uh, no, in Lexington, Kentucky, sorry. Uh, in Lexington, Kentucky in July when it was hot. The water was hot and muggy. We went out in his backyard and there was about a six foot tall pine tree. It looked like it was covered with snow. And I said, Arturo, what's going on with that tree? It looks like it has snow on it. And he walked me across the, with me across the yard to the tree. And as we got closer, he said, whenever I find a feather on the ground, I always bring it home and glue it on the end of one of the branches of this tree. Oh my gosh. I know. See, who would think of that except an artist with that creative mind? Yeah, wow. It's just so much fun. That is great. Well, we've got just a couple more images and I think we've got, we're just right on time. Look at this beautiful piece. Yeah, this is a smaller one I bought from Ellen and Eddie. Uh, it has a, a story, two stories. Uh, in the quilt, the polar bear down in the lower left-hand corner is sleeping and dreaming. And it dreams that it's a spirit is going up the moonbeams to the, to the moon. Now, Ellen Ann told me that she, it, this was made at a period of her life uh, when apparently she, something traumatic had happened and dreaming was the source of her uh, ideas for quilts. And she, because of this uh, event, she stopped dreaming. And she decided that maybe if she made a quilt about dreaming, she could start dreaming again and she made this quilt and sure enough, when she finished making it, she started dreaming, dreaming and her creativity came back. Wow. But that, you know, the, um, the that's iceberg, what's so great. The iceberg incidentally is made with 14 layers of organza. Wow. Well, you know, one time when I'm recently, I had a, I did an interview with Penny McMorris as part of our 25th celebration. And I asked her what it was about quilts and could she tell me what drew her to particular quilts? And she said, I really can't. What it is, is that I just have this emotional reaction. And I love that the artists put all this emotion into their quilts. And then we as viewers are inspired or moved by it as well. And I think that says so much about a, a what is really a successful and, and interesting artwork is that it stirs you in a way that you don't even really know why exactly, but it moves you in such an impactful way. Yes, yeah. Well, I think we've got just one more slide and we're about getting to the end of our hour, Jack. So here's Rebecca Shore. Well, we're ending up with the beginning because uh, two months after I had my 800 slide viewing with Penny, uh, I was going to visit my daughter, Kathy, in Chicago, where she was in law school. And Penny was aware that there was a show of Rebecca Shore's quilts in uh, a gallery in Chicago. So she got two catalogs. We poured over all the catalogs and we picked out an art quilt that we liked. And I went to uh, Chicago and Kathy and I went to look at, at the art quilt and, and I was going to buy it. But when I got there, the art quilt that we uh, had looked at and had decided on was not available for sale. And there was an art quilt in the show that we ha had not seen in the catalog. And that was the one I bought. I took off, started off on a little bit of my own independence. And uh, as Penny always was and is, she just was so encouraging. And when I brought Nightlight back, oh, uh, then uh, she was very complimentary about the selection. I also like to mention about this, I talked about uh, the quilt collection documenting the full range of what's going on. And here's an instance. Uh, this takes off from the Amish, solemn, somber colors and two-dimensional, simple two-dimensional geometries. Well, what Rebecca has done is she has now made an isometric view so that it's a, a three-dimensional uh, image, and she has added some, some bright yellow to, to, to add uh, color, uh, uh, accents of bright color there. Uh, so that's an example of something that's in the collection that is fairly close to 
uh, a traditional design, and yet at the same time, uh, it ventures into the world of art. Now, one of the things too that impresses me is that so many of the artists in the collection uh, have uh, training and experience in other media, whether it's painting, printmaking, uh, sculpture, ceramics. Uh, and here's a case where Rebecca, uh, her profession was as a painter, and then she switched and became a art quilt maker. And now she has switched back and she is doing paintings again and not doing quilts. Wow. Well, Jack, that is just incredible. I'm going to um, stop our slide program now because we're almost at the time we, we've got to be on our on our way. But um, Jack, we've had so many comments. I can't even read them all for you. We'll share you with them share them with you after the program, but people are just so appreciative of you sharing your collection and all of the stories. And it's, it's just so much fun to hear about your journey. And we just appreciate you being here with us so much. And one last question, if I could, Jack, um, is there a catalog of your collection? Well, the only catalog I have of the collection is one that was done when I had a show at the University of Kentucky Art Museum. Uh, back in 2001 and well, Jack. they did a, a great catalog on that it has about 35 pieces uh, but other than that uh, nothing has has ever been uh, put in print for the whole collection well well maybe that's the next project Jack is that you you get that publication people would be fascinated to see that um Jack I'm so sorry we have to go our time is up and um Wow, just a really a terrific program. And gosh, here's somebody who says, you're an American hero, Jack. And I really do think that as uh, people who really are, appreciate the art quilt and, and really are, are many of these people are artists themselves, there is nothing better than a patron who takes so much time to understand and appreciate his quilts. And, and we are just so delighted to have had this time with you today. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, but I, I, don't, I don't deserve any uh, any particular compliments because uh, it's the artists who have created this, these wonderful works. And, and for me, it's a labor of love. And I would just say one more thing, and that is uh, it also has become a mission of my collection to get the uh, art quilts out uh, like is happening at the International Quilt Museum where the artists can be appreciated and where the works can be appreciated. And I, I so am so thankful every time there's an opportunity to share. Oh. So thank you all for being here today. Well, thank you so much, Jack. And thank you everybody for attending. Um, make sure you are here next week for our next textile talk. Um, and um, go to the, the museum's website, the International Quilt Museum, and you can see many more of Jack's quilts with our Matterport program. You can do your virtual walkthrough um, and um, enjoy even more. So thank you all so much.